In his ancestral heartland of Amur, in farthest Siberia, the snow tiger, as the ancients called him, still survives, but only just. A scattered remnant of 50 or 60 pairs now represent a wild species that, within the historical epoch, enjoyed a range which stretched from Manchuria to Lake Baikal. Evolution molded this great tiger to prey upon the huge local races of elk, deer and wild swine, which until quite recently were plentiful in that region of Asia. Now deforestation and development, accompanied by roads, railways and the rifle, have all but sealed his fate. When the Siberian tiger is gone, how, if at all, will he be remembered? We have shared a planet with him, but seem to have learned nothing from his example. His age-proven ability to act as a responsible overlord at the apex of the faunal scale to benefit those he preys upon and to restrain rather than to exploit his awesome powers. Parvenu man has stolen from him his land, his food and most of his lives. We have compounded these crimes by assassinating his character and incorporating him into our language as a symbol of ferocity he does not possess. Cruelty he knows nothing of and a bloodthirst he has never experienced. A paradigm rather than a pariah, the grandeur of his pride, the loftiness of his place, the tempered by a loyal and affectionate nature. To know the tiger is not only to admire him, but to love him also. I bought Howlitz in the spring of 1958, a dilapidated Neo-Palladian mansion in 50 acres of ancient parkland, a perfect setting for my newly acquired wild animals. My own children were brought up with the animals themselves and learned to play with them before they themselves could walk. My little son, Bassa, was placed in the arms of fully grown gorillas at the age of six months. Already, he is recognized as an honorary, if diminutive, member of the gorilla family. My daughter, Jamunda, can still enter the enclosure of the adult gorillas, and the young males extend to her a gentleness in play that they withhold from me. To be raised among wild animals is to love them and respect them. From these two ingredients are distilled a reverence for the whole natural world whence we sprang and on which we depend for our existence. The animals at Howlitz have always enjoyed good experiences with Homo sapiens, and this has engendered in them a real trust for the whole of our species. I firmly believe that the gulf that divides us from the world of animals is a man-made one. We must seek to narrow it so that we can leap back across it and mix with our kindred again after a lapse of thousands of years. If you lay out friendship and affection on a wild animal, laced with respect, it will be returned in good measure. If the animals at Howlitz had any inkling or understanding of the way the human races decimated their relatives in the wild state, their attitude to us might be somewhat different. As it is, they reside with us, convinced of our friendship and respect, and confident that they are part of a family rather than inmates of a jail, or worst of all, exhibits to be gawped at and made fun of. Our culture invites us to despise the masterpieces of nature and to reserve our admiration for ourselves and our own artifacts. The days have long since gone when animals can be kept just to satisfy vulgar or academic curiosity. What is needed is a yus animalium, 
a charter of the rights of beasts, so that all animals, wild and domestic, can have some representation in the legislature and real protection from the law. The wild creatures that howl its are refugees or descendants of refugees, safe, we hope, for a few decades from the ravages of the human race. One day we hope the time will come when we can send them back off off to the lands that we have stolen from them and made our own. The odds are not good, the chance is slim, but we must grasp the gamble with both hands and pray for time and justice, neither of which, of course, appears to be on our side. One cannot deny that the chimpanzee has less dignity than the gorilla, but as a braciator or arm walker, he is manifestly more graceful. Though of course smaller than their lordly cousins, they pack the same muscular strength, pound for pound, far and away in excess of anything a mere human athlete could muster. Richard, the keeper, and I are careful to remove Buster, the patriarch, when we enter their enclosure. Though normally of an equable disposition, he would sooner or later involve us in a hierarchical squabble. Such a fight could only have one ending, as two powerful men could only put up token resistance to a chimp on the warpath. Male chimps are more prone to frenzies than the placid gorilla. And when in the throes of rage or muck rage, the adrenaline really begins to surge in the blood. A chimp berserk is a chimp who can call on the strength of half a dozen weightlifters. And tests with the use of strength machines made in an American primate institute confirm this. Such displays are effective in deterring would-be predators and discouraging the challenges of ambitious young males. The chimpanzee almost appears to concede superiority to man, and he is less capable of arousing the awe and wonder that the great gorilla so effortlessly inspires. He is noisy, emotional, and clever to boot. He wears his heart on his sleeve and unabashedly imitates us in our presence. So closely related is the chimpanzee to man that the Russians have fertilized a chimp ovum with human sperm the feat of surviving for five months only. One might have thought then, that owing to his close relationship with chimpanzees, man would have extended to them some of the love and care he's lavished on his own kind. Needless to say, the opposite is the case. We use our cousins for medical research into human ailments, and even for seatbelt experiments. A grisly irony as only one chimp survives on the planet for every 100,000 humans. So are the scales weighted in man-made justice. As his numbers dwindled to a mere remnant in the African forest, we scarcely cast a glance in his direction. Other, of course, than to ensure that there are a few more specimens left for the laboratory. Among the proudest looking of all hoofed animals are their own antelope, and the bravest. Even a weak old calf will challenge an approaching predator and sell its life as dearly as it can. A roan cow has been photographed dispersing a whole pride of lions, and many a predator has been impaled on their sweeping, corrugated horns. These nilgai are India's largest antelope. The bulls are bluish gray in color and carry serviceable dagger-like horns. They are creatures of the dry scrub savanna and survived in considerable numbers until the Second World War. The Barasinga or swamp deer are among India's rarest animals. They change color from winter to summer when they shed their dun coat for a yellowish buff one. 
East Deer favor the marshy swamplands of the Indo-Gangetic Plain and resort to the foothills during the heat of the summer. Not more than a thousand are left in the wild state and less than a hundred in zoos throughout the world. In India, the vast herds of Nilgai and Blackbuck that swarmed on the dry savannas and open plains respectively have vanished completely. One could certainly see more Indian animals at Howlett's in one afternoon than in a three-month tour of the subcontinent. The destruction of the forest canopy, now almost total, is the death warrant for Indians three species of deer. The great chocolate samba, the axis or spotted and the sturdy hog deer. To keep wild animals properly and to husband them well, a keeper must be conscious of the gravity of his task. A bond of affection in the end will prove stronger than the mere call of duty. He must believe from within himself that his animals are at least as important, if not more important, than the human race. Keepers are born, not made. One aspirant in seven or eight has it in him to relate to an animal in depth. That is a keeper. And that is a fortunate human, for he has the joy of experiences and interrelationships given only to a handful of men. I doubt if there is any zoo in the world where the staff enter the enclosures of all the animals as a matter of daily routine. Such personal contact is a focal point of an animal's day and adds a necessary extra dimension. There is nothing in this of the circus, no fear, no reward, no behavior washing. Only a mutual transfer of trust and affection. Risks there may be, but applause is there none. The risks appear obvious. The rewards hard to define. Parity with tigers, to be accepted, to talk to them, to frolic with their cubs in their presence, to embrace and be embraced. All this is balm to the keeper. It lifts his soul and warms his nights in winter. One of nature's problem children is the cheetah, as in captivity he needs certain special conditions in which to breed. As his state in the wild is one of terminal decline, it is incumbent on us to act fast. There are over a thousand in world zoos and safari parks, and less than 10% of these are breeding. Universally acknowledged as the fastest of all mammals, it is less well known how graceful a cheetah can be.
What an astounding creature is the elephant. The Indian elephant is a forest animal and closely related to the woolly mammoth. That he should have survived down to our own time is a wondrous thing. No successful birth has ever been recorded in Britain for the African or the Indian race. Even today, few zoos accept the challenge of keeping bulls. The four bulls at Howlitz represent half the population of elephant bulls in Great Britain. Zoo directors who keep only cow elephants should make amends as quickly as they can. We believe it is a crime to keep a wild animal without allowing it to reproduce its own kind, particularly when that animal is being carefully shepherded to extinction. great beasts are destructive of trees. But this is true only when they cram into a refuge and where sheer weight of numbers will place too much pressure on the vegetation. In natural conditions, the elephant is the friend of the woodlands. Its crude alimentary system enables many kernels to pass through and germinate when deposited with several kilos of dung. Even the seemingly wasteful habit of pushing over thorn trees can be beneficial as the fallen tree crown provides an impregnable redoubt for young saplings. The Kaloli people of the Shobi River country in Botswana have an old saying that has been passed on through countless generations. The day that no elephant dung can be seen by the side of the river, that day, the saying goes, will be the end of the world. The black rhinoceros is an animal that is easy to admire. Unlike his white cousin, he reacts to threat by counter threat. Challenge him, and as often as not, he'll challenge you. Those who've really studied them in the wild, like Goddard and Schenkel, can scarcely hide their affection and respect. He has had difficulty in evolving new survival techniques since the European arrived on the scene with his heavy rifle 150 years ago. It is only since that rueful day that he recruited the services of the oxpecker birds to provide him with a second pair of eyes, his own being short-sighted, to warn him of danger downwind, a brilliant behavioral innovation that speaks well for his intelligence.
The black rhino is a browser rather than a grazer, and the finger-like prehensile upper lip is ideally suited to grass leaves and the tough legumes that he favors. His thick, massive legs belie his athletic power. He can turn on a sixpence and change direction at full gallop in a matter of yards. His hearing is of the best, and the ears are sensitive and mobile and fringed with a comb of hairs. Essential for its health and happiness is a good wallow. Some proprietorial instincts are aroused by a wallow, though these animals appear to have only the vaguest territorial sense. Mud wallows and dust wallows are equally popular, and when the mud dries and flakes off, a number of ticks are sloughed off in the process. The thick mud also acts as an insulation against the sun and helps heal surface wounds and discourages the attention of blood-sucking flies. a great day when we wake up one morning and find that a rhino calf has been born to Naivashar or Rukwa. An average of only four or five are born yearly in captivity throughout the world. The honey badger would be on any naturalist's shortlist for the world's bravest animal. I once took a young male badger on a walk through the park with a three-quarter grown tiger. I soon lived to regret it, as the tiger was savagely attacked and I had some difficulty in separating them. As a honey badger can turn round in its own skin, I got severely bitten for my pains as I carried him at arm's length back to his enclosure. Many a native African has been unpleasantly surprised to flush an irate honey badger when digging out a warthog and has sometimes paid for his trouble with the loss of his testes. When they bite, they never let go. Salus, the 19th century elephant hunter, found the body of a cow buffalo with the corpse of a honey badger still clinging to its nose. The strange coloration of black underneath and white on top is thought to be a moonlight camouflage and possibly a warning signal to would-be predators, few of whom I imagine would make the error of attacking him more than once. The sow badger will retreat into a deep burrow to give birth to two or sometimes three cubs who are naked and blind for several weeks. Unprovoked, he is a charming mammal, and we are very proud at Howlett to be the first ever to breed this species in captivity. The Tsawalski, or Mongolian wild horse, is the only breed of wild horse left in the world and is probably extinct in the wild state. Some 200 survive in zoos, and even these have about one-eighth domestic blood.
they cannot be broken and are famed for the hardness of their hooves and their stamina. The herd stallion is usually exceptionally brave and will, if pursued to the point where his mares and foals are at risk, charge the hunters, knowing full well that his life is forfeit. At Port Lim, the herd has 30 acres to call its own, and true group behavior can be studied. The Russian naturalist Banikov believes that a few may still persist in the Altai steppes of Mongolia. But no live horse has been sighted for years. The American bison, a mere 200 years ago, were believed to number 60 or 70 million. Single herds so large that they took four days to pass a homestead have been recorded. Some zoologists believe that a large migrating bison herd represented the greatest mammalian biomass ever known. By the end of the 19th century, there were only about 3,000 survivors. The classic case of genocide. The grass seas that were the prairies became cornfields or cattle ranges. Animals that had withstood sandstorm and flood, that had weathered glacial winters and spectral droughts. Animals that had crossed rivers in spate and survived the prairie fires fell to the hand of man. Victims of his spurious techniques, objects of his shameless greed. His numbers today have been nursed back to a meager 30,000. But the whole ecosystem that he helped to sustain has disappeared. And thus his future must remain a perilous one. The tiger is a lazy but fastidious beast, sleeping 17 out of 24 hours and grooming himself for an average of two more. No mud or blood is allowed to stain his person for long. Contrary to conventional opinion, tame tigers breed better than wild ones in captivity. We have found at Howlitz that we hardly ever lose a cub from a friendly animal, and that they are invariably excellent mothers. This is because they feel confident and relaxed and without fear of man. A frightened cat will discard and sometimes kill and even eat its young. has, I think, helped to restore in the public mind the good name and character of this great cat. If it is emotional honesty, predictability of temperament, capacity for loyalty and affection that we are looking for, then we find these in the tiger, along with an almost bottomless fund of good nature.
Corbett, the great hunter, said after a lifetime of chasing and harassing the tiger that he was a gentleman. The truth is, we have much to learn from him. Where he was supreme, we now reign as usurpers. How can our brief overlordship be compared with his lengthy regnum? Undisputed master of his range, he benefited the animals he preyed upon. Untouched tiger wilderness amazed the early explorers for the quality and quantity of the game animals. Both were the handiwork of Panthera tigris. Now, where man has dominated for a few centuries, all is a shambles. The desert steals south as the vast human overburden, in its panic, eliminates the remaining vestigial jungles and transform them into monocultures themselves to be shortly swallowed up by the encroaching sands. much to learn from the tiger is as obvious as the fact that we're unable to do so. And inside that strange irony can our future and theirs be measured. Feeding the animals presents us with special problems. The elephant, for instance, is a vast boiler that needs constant stoking. And, as this implies, no artificial heat is necessary for his comfort, as he generates his own. Open the door of his sleeping quarters on a frosty January morning, and one is met by a rush of warm air. A gorilla eats over 200 types of plant in the wild, and we manage to provide him with over 90 different foods throughout the year. It is vital to stimulate his interest in meals by variety. For a confined ape, his food forms almost the aspect of a special culture. The gorilla is a true gourmet, an adept at judging the quality of his fare. There are a few delicacies that he prefers to rose petals, and we have a plentiful supply of these throughout the summer.
Most zoos make the mistake of feeding the big cats every day to please their public. This routine is bad for the psychology of the animals. We feed irregularly, about once a week, and then a 70-pound haunch or shoulder of meat at a time. This method is closer to his habits in the wild, where he would, if he was lucky, make 40 to 50 kills a year. The tiger is a reluctant hunter, bestirring himself only when pressed by hunger. For each successful kill, there are many failures. Often he risks injury as he needs large prey, and such game is strong and powerful. Contrary to popular fancy, he does not love the hand that feeds him. He rather resents the appearance of his friend, the keeper, with meat that he feels belongs to him by visual right the moment that he sees it. When really hungry, it is dangerous for either his mate or his offspring or his human friends to approach him. One difficulty with feeding the animals at Howlett is to provide them with a semblance of the varied diet they would expect in the wild state. The seasons largely dictate the state of the menu, from rose petals to raw meat, the winter being the most difficult time. One of the saddest stories that we have to tell is of this cow bull, whose two cows died in quarantine in northern England. This noble ox is down to a few hundred only in India, Burma and Malaysia. Fortunately, half a dozen zoos have established breeding groups, so it is possible the species may yet be saved. The Brazilian tapir, however, still holds its own in the Amazon forests. Nowhere exactly numerous, he is yet to be found over a huge area of South America. A perfect model of a tropical horse, he has remained unchanged morphologically for 10 million years. It is a long process breeding tapirs, and much patience is required as they do not mate until they've reached five or six years of age, and then the gestation period is a further 13 months. But the yellow striped baby, however, when it does arrive, 
is an ample reward. At one time, I thought that the 50 acres of Howlitz would be ample for the animal's needs. But for a few years now, I've been looking for another estate nearby, where the burgeoning herds could have more land, and where I could spaciously accommodate the creatures that have bred so profusely. This search led me to buy Port Lynn, a beautiful house with terraced gardens resting on a steep escarpment overlooking the channel and in sight of France. Over three years of work was needed to enable us to open the Port Lim Wildlife Sanctuary to the public. And many more years will pass before a full restoration of the house and garden can be accomplished. Neglected since the outbreak of war in 39, the task before us was and remains a daunting one. But for the wild herds, Port Lim has already proved a blessing. It lifts my heart to see the African buffalo disporting themselves on the sward, safe from the poacher and the hunter, and fearless of man. Though it is convenient to see animals at close quarters in an urban zoo, it gives a deeper sense of pleasure to watch them in paddocks large enough for the animals to indulge in genuine herd behavior. Quarreling, stampeding, reuniting, wallowing, dust bathing, ruminating, displaying and making love. Here at Port Lim, the herds enjoy their newfound freedom and we expect their numbers to increase accordingly. It is only since Darwin that mankind has begun to understand himself and has been able to place his own species in an evolutionary context. 10,000 years of religio-cultural veneers have since the dawn of history distorted and even hidden from us the realities of our own nature. We who scarcely understand ourselves are in no position to unravel the arcane mysteries of gorilla behavior. I doubt if all the knowledge of these apes was pulled together drawn from the experiences of, among others, Diane Fossey, Ernst Lang and George Schaller, it would amount to more than a small fraction of the totality of gorilla knowledge. What Hegel says of history, we can say of the gorilla. 
the only thing we learn from studying this ape is how little we know of him. I have little doubt and every hope that he will remain a mystery. After 18 years of intimate contact, I'm still enchanted with the unexpectedness and spontaneity of their behavior. To enter their enclosure and to play with them, to be accepted by them as some sort of honorary member of the band is now for me an indispensable part of my life. On one occasion, I was attacked by Shamba, the dominant female, and the others sprang to my aid. Imagine my feelings, my sense of belonging. I once thought that the chances of being tolerated by an adult male were remote, but I've now changed my mind. Mumba at 12 and Jum at 9 are so protective and gentle that I have rekindled hopes of being able to go in with them for the rest of my life, or at least for as long as my health lasts. At 50, my physique is not what it was, and when Mumba, who weighs nearly 300 pounds, jumps on me or uses me as a vaulting horse, I find that my frame creaks under the strain. With fully grown gorillas, it is best to let them make the first overture, as they are, like ourselves, creatures of mood. Gorillas, like man and the chimpanzee, are social animals. His natural unit is a band or extended family. It is only through interaction and interplay within such a grouping that he can hope to find full expression. To keep him alone or in pairs is for him a protracted form of death. So aloof in temperament and covered in expression of his emotions, a passionate undercurrent of loyalty binds the family. To witness their bond-strengthening behavior is a glowing experience. We've much to learn from the way they can counterbalance any overweening display of power. The cause of a quarrel seems seldom to concern them. The outnumbered or overpowered is automatically supported. A biological reaction that has enabled the Howlett's family now numbering 17 to survive for 15 years without an injury of any sort worth the mention. The dominant male is a benevolent ruler, and the whole band will take its cue from him. Family attributes and likenesses are clearly discernible in the wild. The patriarch is not necessarily the largest, though he must reach qualifying proportions. The major decisions rest with him. Where to sleep and nest, what to eat and where to go. His power bases the confidence and trust of the adult females. But the alpha male must also be a good botanist and a sound topographer. Sandy Harcourt, who worked for years with Diane Fossey studying mountain gorillas in the Virunga Plateau, told me he once saw an overlord take his family on a two-hour trek across difficult country to a remote valley where they gorged on the strange red fruit which had just ripened. His seasonal timing and sense of direction were faultless.
Kijo, Baikasoro out of Juju, was the first of five gorillas born at Howlett so far. Fortunately, Juju proved the perfect mother and set an example to the other mothers-to-be that was followed with varying degrees of success. The art and culture of motherhood is passed on visually in primate societies, instinct alone being woefully insufficient. The baby stays with the mother even after a younger brother or sister appears on the scene. When Kijo was over a year old, we let his father, Kisoro, in with him. And now we put them together frequently. Other adult females, aunties, treat the infant tenderly, sometimes being allowed to pick it up and carry it around for brief periods. Juvenile males like to tease the mother and the baby, and in the wild are probably given a fairly wide berth. Kisoro, who is loaned to us by Lincoln Park Zoo Chicago, has fathered seven offspring, which puts him in the lineup for world champion stud gorilla. He is certainly the only gorilla in history, or prehistory for that matter, that has sired stock both sides of the Atlantic. Hand-reared infants present quite a problem, as they have to imprint themselves on their human foster parents. Without this mother transfer, they will not even live. But at about nine months, the time comes to reinstate them back into the gorilla band. This is a lengthy and painful process. To attempt it hurriedly is to invite disaster. And many babies have been lost through lack of patience on this score. The gorilla baby is emotionally more delicate than his human counterpart. If suddenly removed from his surrogate mother, he will pine away and die. It takes six or seven months of gradual transfer to complete this operation with success. One of the main behavioural features that distinguishes mammals from all other living things is the extended period of mother-infant relationship. Generally speaking, the higher the mammal, the longer the bond. Among social animals like men, apes, elephants or whales, this attachment can last a lifetime. But with other creatures, it becomes necessary at some point to expel the offspring from the family fold. 
As far as humans are concerned, there is a dangerous modern tendency to weaken the family bonds by allowing the state to usurp the roles of father and mother alike. As all human groupings originated from an extension of the nuclear family, this course is likely to have baleful consequences. The family become the band, the band the clan, the clan the tribe, the tribe the nation. We have so much to learn from the study of the kindred mammalia. Beware of those who shy at any inferences drawn from animal behavior to human behavior. These people are the heirs of those who laughed at Darwin and Galileo. People who still believe that the whole planet and all its occupants were designed for one purpose and one purpose only. The aggrandizement of man, man in the image of God. <laughs>